Hi, I'm Lily. Today I'm going to show you some behind the scenes of my latest gothic stop motion animation. If you haven't seen it yet, I'm going to put a link above and in the description below. In my last video, I've shown in detail how I made the whole gothic church by hand and from scratch. Today I'm going to give you a tour of my workshop, my equipment, my setup, and show you some tips and tricks of how I bring this story to life. So this gothic stop motion animation has been a bit of a labor of love. I think I spent at least 50 hours in my dark room uh, to animate the puppets in the gothic church. I'm going to talk today about my equipment first, then the setup for particular scenes, and also I'm going to talk about the alteration I've done to my puppet to fit specific movements. I use my desktop with Dragon Frame installed on it. It's connected to my camera, a Canon EOS RP. When it comes to lighting, I've used a GVM 800D to light in the middle of the altar. I've also used a much stronger Aperture 60X to bounce on the ceiling and to spread the light throughout. I've used another one of those LED panels to bounce on the ceiling as well. I've used a small Aperture MC with the handmade honeycomb grip to be able to specifically light up the face on the side of it. So I like to have all my equipment completely flexible. So my desktop is installed on a chair that is taped to a table that I found in the streets. So I can simply move my table around and shoot some scene from another angle. So I can remove the sidewall, for example, slide the front back in. Then I just need to adjust my desktop next to the table, place my camera in front at the right height. In this specific scene, I can see through the windows, so it was important to add some foliage to avoid having just a piece of wood or whiteboard showing. And I was happy to have my desktop on my table so I can move it around so I can see the screen and see what the camera sees and adjust the foliage to fit into the window opening. Then I can move my little desktop station back in, adjust the camera, also adjust the little Aperture MC because that was important to light up the face. I was really happy to have the app for the Aperture MC so I can really adjust and put only the amount of light I want on the face. And then it's all about finding a good spot so I can animate my puppet, I can have good access and see the screen and what the camera sees, and at the same time stay away from the camera to avoid any risk of knocking it while I do my animation. For the opening shot, the camera is positioned in front of the building and I have a much better access on the side to animate the doors. And then once again, I can just take the front of the building out, put the wall back in, move my equipment around and get a much better position to animate the next scene. I like to use a head torch when I have to risk up the face so I have a much better uh, lighting on the specific spot that I try to transform. I sincerely recommend using some knee pads depending on the height of your set. For example, in this scene, I probably spent two hours shooting it and I was so relieved to have those knee pads. I also have the Dragon Frame keypad so I can take my pictures remotely. I can tell you that after spending two hours on my knees in this specific position to animate the puppets, once I was finally able to go back up, I remember I emitted some really loud noises out of relief. Gosh, that was painful. Sometimes I like to remove the puppets from its initial location and place it on a little bit of timber. That makes it easier to access, to risk out the arm or the face, for example, but also to change the face altogether. I had a set of four faces. I can simply take one out and place the other one back in. So I have a much cleaner face for the next scene. So now there's one scene where the wings of the puppets turn from white to black. To do that, I've dry brushed the wings with black paint. And that was a stressful scene because I knew there was no way back. So in order to get more confidence and more practice, first I use a little dummy. For that, I create this beautiful little mock-up out of leftover clay, lace, and one of the first wing I've done as a test. So I just assemble them together. That was also a good way to test how I'm going to place my dagger, how I'm going to add some blood without being, being too gory. So I was more comfortable playing around with this one. And then once I was happy with the look of it, I can reproduce the same effect on my actual puppets. Then I place it into the set and start doing my dry brushing. A little bit at a time, taking a picture and repeat again and again. 
The key to dry brushing is to remove as much of the paint as possible, especially if you're working on a black paint on a white wing. So I remove almost all of it and then very carefully dry brush it slowly but surely picture by picture until it turned completely black and once i've done that test i was more confident and i have more experience to be able to do it on the actual puppets there's another scene where my puppet is on her knees and out of rage and emotional pain she starts screaming so for that scene i had to set up my tripod above the set and it needed to be perfectly lined up then i've covered all around my camera with some black fabric because i wanted to make sure that i blocked the lights coming in before that when i was shooting the scene there was an actual ceiling blocking all the light from entering so i wanted to keep the lighting cohesive with the rest of the shoot so I had to block it from entering and then I can animate it through the main front door. The last scene of the first part was when her wings were coming back together and then I was able to release my puppet. By then it was looking in really poor state. As you can see when I was bending those wings to come together their base which is aluminium wire came out of the back of the puppets so it was barely holding in there you can see the, the top has just split open and you can even see her butts but it didn't really matter because she has done her job her purpose has been fulfilled now it looks very different to the other puppets which is brand new ready to go and wrapped up in clean feel to avoid having any dust sticking into it so now i'm going to talk a little bit about the puppets because if you've seen some other of my animation it looks different i wanted to cover the whole puppet and close with polymer clay the only material i've used that is not polymer clay is for the wing and that is made of two millimeter craft foam and wire so previously when I've done my puppet, all the faces were done with Super Sculpey for the skin tone and Fimo for the hair and everything else. In this case, I wanted to do the body as well with Polly McClay and Fimo. It's not just aesthetically that I wanted my puppet to look different. I wanted for them to be able to create a specific movement. In that case, falling on her knees and stay there while being completely stable and attached to the ground. So if you've done uh, puppets before for stop animation, so that's a very basic example of what's inside my puppets. The skeleton is made with wire and epoxy putty. Usually I add some knots in the feet so I can attach firmly to the ground. And if I want my puppet to fall on her knees, as you can see here, she cannot have the screws attached anymore. So usually to do that, you use a rig. I don't like rigs. They are getting in the way and then you have to remove it later so this is just another example as you can see the puppets cannot get on her knees while the screws are staying in a way to sort that problem is to simply re-engineer the feet so this is my new puppets as you can see it looks very similar to the previous one but the main difference is in the feet i've added a bit of wire and i've bent it in front of the feet so as you can see it can stay attached to the ground, but still move forward and get on her knees. And you can see a little bit better with the close up how this works. It's just not rocket science. It's simply just adjusting the component that is needed for her to perform this specific movement. I'm going to talk about the rest of the puppet that I've done out of polymer clay. To create the big dresses, first I made a little cone out of aluminium mesh that I shaped as I wanted. Then I've placed a lace on top of some polymer clay that I've passed through the pasta machine to make sure the lace bond firmly with the clay. If you have a stiff lace that will work better and be less fiddly, then I just have to remove the excess, carefully place it onto my aluminium mesh and shape the clay all around. Then I can fold the top part of my clay Then I pass my little skeleton through it and then I can press much more around the waist. Added more polymer clay to create the torso. I wanted to add the wing later on so I drilled some holes at the back in the epoxy putty and I've placed some wire to make sure I'm not filling those holes and I know exactly where the wings needs to get in. I repeat the whole process with some darker clay and a small piece of lace. Place it around the torso and shape it. So I've done the same thing twice and every time I keep the leftover of clay so I can touch it up later on and I wrap them up in clean fill to avoid having the dust gathering around it. 
when it comes to the coat made out of feathers. For a previous project, I've created a silicone mold for feathers. So I basically sculpt a few of them in different sizes, pour some silicone over it, and I've got a mold. And this came so handy for this project because I can simply use some FIMO, press it into this mold, and I have a feather. For the head, I've done it the same way as I usually do. Super sculpty for the skin tone, FIMO for the hair and everything else. The eyes is FIMO as well that I've cooked. I've added some shoulder armor that I've made out of black warbler and a tiny piece of ribbon. Once everything was assembled, I tried to pass it through my supervisor, but I can see that she was not remotely interested or impressed. So now I have all my puppets, the main one for the first part, the black one for the second part, and then I have my test doll. For the second part of my animation, where the church looked abandoned, I've placed my dark doll in position. And first I shoot the close-up, which was the most important one, and then the wide. Because I knew at that stage the puppet would look its best, and it will only go south from there. So that's why I took some time for those shots, and I begin with them. The following scene, the puppet was walking through the church. So now I have a lovely puppet with a big dress and I didn't want to lift the dress every time to access the screws underneath. It will distort the clay. So the solution I found is to install them onto a drawer slider and some little bracket that I found around my workshop. To come up with this system, first I've done some tests. So I've used my test doll, which looks really poorly at that stage, but she's been through a lot already. And I've used some triangular bracket that I just found around my workshop, placed them against the base of the set, and then placed the drawer sliders on top of them. I drill some holes into my triangular bracket to make sure I can attach the slider to it. And I've used some drill bits specifically for metal. Then I can attach it properly to the bracket underneath and make sure the sliders can still move in and out. I marked some reference line, which I thought would be handy, but to be honest, I haven't used them. I drilled some secondary hole because I wanted to make sure I have a much firmer attachment and the sliders will not be moving around. Once I was happy with that, I removed the screws and as you can see, the puppet is just holding onto shorter screws. I had to use some spacer because even the shorter screws I had still leave a gap, so I just fill the gap as much as possible. Once I was satisfied with the whole system, I just moved my actual puppets into place and then drill my brackets back onto the main board. Add the secondary screws above to make sure it stays firmly in this position. Tested it out. Choose a nice angle to create this walking movement. At that stage, I realized it was a bit wobbly because I haven't tightened the screws enough. I should have put more spacer to make sure I have a firm attachment. So the right thing to do at that stage will have been to remove the whole system, to remove the screws, to add some spacer and to put the whole thing back in. That will have been the right thing to do. Is it what I've done? Of course not, because I'm stubborn and I like to stick with some of my bad decisions. But anyway, it was feasible. And even if there was a bit of wobbliness, honestly, I'm really happy with how it turned out. It was a challenge. And at some point I wanted to make sure I can have the puppet walking all the way through the camera almost. And for that, I have to move the sliders with the puppets on it. So I was holding a puppet, tried to move the sliders, unscrewing, rescrewing forward with the puppet still want to just fall forward. So yeah, that, that, was, that was tricky to manage. Then there's this pretty cool scene when you can see the camera goes all around the puppets. To do that, I've used a Shot Villa Motorized Curve 120 degrees, and that's a lovely piece of kit to have. I think I found mine on eBay. I only wish you can adjust the head, you can adjust the height and the angle, but unfortunately I couldn't do that, so I had to build it up with some boxes and bits and bobs that I duct tape in place. It looks primitive, but it works, that's what matters. And then I have the remote. Uh, it didn't come with any instruction because that's just more fun. So I had to do lots of playing around to figure out how to adjust the dial and create the right amount of movements. I put them almost on the minimum, both of them. 
And if you keep your finger on the button, you can have a continuous movement for a video, for example. But for stop motion animation, I wanted to have just one tiny bit of movement every single time. So I just press once every time I wanted to move the camera forward. This whole sequence is 266 pictures. So there was really little movement in between each shots. And it took me roughly three hours to make. The lighting for the second part of the animation when it was an abandoned church was similar in the way that you still have the GVM 800D lighting up the middle of the altar. The stronger Aperture 60X is bouncing on the side board, which is two wide boards clamped onto a C stand, and they bounce the light sideways so they can enter from the windows on the side of the church. I had another one of those GVM 800D bouncing on another wall so that they can enter back in in front of the church. And then I have a third of those panels on the side to enter the other windows. I've added my little Aperture MC on top of the roof because I now had this opening through the roofs and I wanted to get lights back in. So I bounced them up with some whiteboard and hold everything with a Gorilla Pod and I can adjust them on the app to make sure I have some really nice lights coming in from the sky. And that's a wrap. I made this whole stop motion animation on my own. It took me 400 hours in total, 250 hours to make the church by hand from scratch, uh, 50 hours-ish to make the puppets, 50 hours to shoot the animation and another week to do the post and edits of the animation. The only external help I had was a fantastic DP, Thierry Burrow, who came over and showed me how to use the lighting and uh, set up my equipment before I've done the animation. Other than that, it's just my own. I've never been to film school, I'm completely self-taught, and I just wanted to show that you can literally make everything on your own. You don't need a big team, you don't need a huge budget, it's feasible and you can teach yourself any software needed on YouTube. There's tons of video, that's how I learn it. The magic ingredient is putting the hours and literally putting a lot of them because that's the thing that's a matter the most to improve your skills and to get into whatever it is, stop motion animation or others. It's just dedicate some time and energy to learn the craft. And actually one year ago, I knew nothing of stop motion animation. If you look on my YouTube channel, you can see the evolution. Last October, 2020, I've done my first stop motion animation ever with a friend of mine, Julie Childs. And we had no idea what we were doing, literally. We didn't have a software. So we were just eyeballing with, with one screen next to another, trying to see if we've moved uh, enough or not too much. We literally had no idea what we were doing. And it's fantastic to see the evolution. And after that, I've done another one on my own, another one, another one. And one year down the line, I made this gothic stop motion animation. And it's, it's brilliant to see the evolution. And that means if you're starting from scratch or if you're completely beginner in it, that's fine. Give yourself time to learn this craft because stop motion animation is just magical. You can literally bring any single story to life. And as I was said earlier, you don't need a huge team or huge budget. You need some material, you need some equipment, and you need some time and effort and energy. And it takes a lot of patience, that's for sure. So keep at it with your own stop motion project. It doesn't matter if you're a completely beginner or you're just frustrated and all that. Give yourself time, be patient, keep at it. And I'm pretty sure by the end of it, you'd be really proud of yourself. So it's worth the effort. Take care.